Hi, what an amazing countdown to start the show. How are you doing? Welcome to Anthony Horowitz Live. What a special event, jointly hosted by Walker Books and the National Literacy Trust. My name's Barney and I'm here today to be your host, to guide you through the questions and also to put you in touch with the great man himself. Who here loves Anthony Horowitz? Hands, you can cheer for him if you want to, that's perfectly normal. Or do a game show, Woo. either way. We know that you're big fans and that's why today is happening. You can ask him whatever you like. I've worked out today, I've known Anthony for about 10 years and I've asked him all the questions, so today it's your turn. Let's think about the man, what he's done. The Alex Ryder series, the Power of Five series, the Diamond Brothers. He was awarded an OBE earlier this year. He's an incredible guy and I think it's about time we got him onto the stage. What do you say? Yeah. He will only come out onto the stage if you're loud enough. So after three, let's try a cheer. One, two, three. Nowhere near loud enough. Now, I know that you're sat with your teachers right now and they normally tell you to be quiet in class, but today, I'm in charge. You can be as loud as you want. After three, please welcome Anthony Horowitz. One, two, three. Yeah! Thanks, Barney. That's Anthony, great. Thank you very much. So good to see you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So, here we are. Now, there's about 200 people in this audience here today, which is a large number of people. Right, it's a lot of people, that's so, true. So, hello to real human being audience. Hello, good to see you. Uh, we also are being piped, as they say, digitally, into 500 different schools. I know, it's fantastic. I've never spoken to such a big audience in my life. I don't think ever. It's an amazing event, and, you know, there's, there's that many people watching. Do you feel nervous about I'm, that? Well, I am nervous. I just want to say, though, I, want to thank, I just want to thank all the teachers who have helped to organise this and, you know, who have, um, you know, maybe changed the school calendar to let people watch this. And I want to apologise to all of you who are missing, I don't know, geography or French to have to do this instead. Oh, yeah, I bet be, they're really, That really must be really depressing that, yeah. instead. Talk about books instead. Well, let's give a big wave to everybody in the yeah, hi, everyone at school. Who are, who are talking about books today. Um, like I said, I've, I've known you for a long, long time. We've done a lot of interviews together. And um, over the years, we've found out lots of cool things. And, and one thing that always fascinates me about you is the brand new ideas that you have and the, the new way you find to write books. If we talk about Russian Roulette, this is the prequel to the series, and you're writing it from a very different perspective, aren't you, this time around? Yeah, that's right. This is the very first book I've ever written, which is not about a good person. Because, isn't it, you notice that every time anyone writes for young people, the hero, if it's Harry Potter or, you know, Percy Jackson, or whoever it is, they're always somebody who does good and saves the world. Yeah. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun, just for a change, to talk about people, or to talk about a boy who becomes bad? What is it in life that turns people bad? I mean, take that boy over there, that one there. Yeah, you. Or, or the guy next to you, one of you two. You look perfectly nice kids, but what would it be that could turn you from being a nice kid into being a cold-blooded killer? <laughs> uh, look, maybe, maybe, that, maybe you already are. I don't know. <laughs> but, but I thought, wouldn't it be fun, just for a change, wouldn't it be fun, just for a change, to explore evil and real evil? So Yasin Grigorovich, who turns up in three or four of the Alex Ryder books and is Alex's worst enemy, I decided, let's try and find out what turned him into this bad guy. Because everybody in life, all of you in this room, you've got choices about what you're going to be, good or bad. You know, and I hope it's all going to be good, but this is about the story of one boy who turns bad. I am scared of you now. Are you going to behave yourself throughout this show? You're you not going to jump up and try and attack anybody, are you? <laughs> OK, good. Um, well, we are here in Sadler's Wells in London. It's a live show, so anything could happen. But let's crack on with the questions. Um, so many people have got in touch. Now, this is a really cool name for one of your books, Raphael Tarry. Raphael, is that that's a, that's that's, somebody who's that's, asked a question? That's the name. I use a lot of names. I, when I do book signings and I meet kids, young people, they often turn up in my books. Well, uh, so that's a good one to start with. Raphael, make sure you're noting that. How long did it take you to write Russian Roulette? Do you have to be in a certain mood when you start writing one of the Alex Ryder books? Um, I, yeah, the first question is, it took me about a year. Every book takes me about one year to write, and, uh, and that, this one was the same. Uh, it was more difficult because I had to go to Russia, I had to do lots of research for it. But uh, as for the mood, that's a very interesting thing. You know, all of you get given work to do at school. I bet you have to write stories, is that right? Yeah, the only way to write a story is to get into the mood of it, to get to the feel of it. You know, if I'm writing about a Russian killer, I have to feel a bit like a Russian killer. I have to sort of get into his mind, and I have to get myself excited because, and this is the whole truth, if you're bored when you start writing, the teacher who reads your work will be bored when they read it because all writing is telepathy. So I get myself very, very excited, I get myself very involved in the book, and only then do I start to write the book. OK, lovely. Um, this is a question asked by a lot of people. How did you get the idea for the Alex Ryder books? Well, Alex Ryder began with James Bond. I mean, that was where it all began. You, who, you, you see James Bond films, right? Yeah? yeah? Who's your favourite James Bond? Sean Connery, Daniel Craig, Roger Moore? 
no, no, a little mixer. A mi yeah. in, in this theatre, there's a mix of opinions. For me, it was always Sean Connery. He was the best Bond. Then Roger Moore took over, and he was the second James Bond, and he went on and on and on. And do you know how old he was when he played James Bond for the last time? I don't know. He was 57 years old. That's, that's old enough to be James Bond's granddad, isn't it? I mean, you know, that's, it's old. It's old. old. Yeah, all yeah. the gadgets in that film hidden in his walking frame. So, you know, it's, <laughs> this was an old man. I mean, I had this idea. I had this one little idea. Wouldn't it be great if James Bond was a teenager again? Because teenagers can do things that adults can't do. I mean, like snowboarding. You know, ki a kid on a snowboard, that's sort of fun. But a yeah. kid's dad on a snowboard, Not as that's sad, sure, isn't it? Yeah. It's just sad, you know? <laughs> so, so I thought, so let's, let's, it was just a light bulb moment. Let's do sort of James Bond, but make him 14 years old. And in that moment, Alex Ryder was born, and my life changed. Because from going selling, you know, like, 100 or a thousand books a year suddenly I was selling a million books a year and it was everything exploded and the whole secret about being a writer if you're going to be a writer in fact whatever it is you want to do in your lives if you believe in yourself and keep doing it long enough that moment will come that light bulb moment when everything suddenly happens you don't know when it's going to happen but it has to happen and it does happen and then you know the world goes crazy and that's what happened with Alex Ryder it was just that single moment let's make James Bond a teenager and bang there I was it's not just your life that changed who here wants to be Alex Ryder Every well. single hand goes into the air there. It's, it's an amazing book. Let's go to the audience for a question. Uh, we've got a question from Saba from Oaks Park High. Where are you? There you go. Hello. Hi. Hi, Saba. Um, my question is, have you ever written a book that has been unpublished or rejected? Wow. That's an interesting question. Um, I'll tell you something. I'm not sure there's a writer in the world who hasn't written a book that's been rejected. You know, if you, whatever you do in life, again, you know, I don't know what you want to do. If you want to be a teacher, a scientist, a train driver, or an astronaut, there'll be somebody who will say no to you. That's just part of life. There's always somebody who says no. And when somebody says no, you have to remember they're an idiot. They don't know. You know better than they do. They are an idiot, OK? And that's the secret of life. Now, of course I got... I got lots of books rejected when I started out. I mean, two or three. My first book was written. Do you know what they said about it? They said, this book is badly written rubbish. Uh, and and I mean, that was, I mean, I had a horrible letter about this book sent to me by a publisher. And, and did I believe in them? No, I didn't. I just put the letter into that. I cried, actually, for an I hour or two. You would have I wept a few tears, <laughs> tore up the letter, felt better, and started the next book and went on. So, yes, I have had books rejected, but I never let it stop me. I just had to put that to one side and keep going. How important is it to have teachers that support you at school as well? Let's say you, you've written something, because teachers are that person. They are the ones that say try harder or do better. Well, that's because they believe in you, I suppose. I think if you're very lucky and you get a... I mean, a bad teacher can spoil your day. A good teacher can change your life. That's the honest truth of it. You know, yep. teachers are, are, are amazing people. They, they, they are... They have such power because they control tomorrow. The people, the young people who go through their hands are going to be, you know, the politicians of tomorrow. They're going to be the, the writers, the leaders, the whatever, of tomorrow. So teachers have a fantastic amount of power. And a good teacher can really make all the difference in the world. Now, in my first school, I really did not like my teachers. They were very, very mean to me. And, and, and they were very, they didn't think I'd amount to anything. They were always down, coming down at me. I have put every teacher from my first school into my books and I've killed every single one of them. <laughs> uh, that's what I do. Genius. But then, in my secondary school, in my secondary school, I met three teachers, and I still remember their names 30-something, 40 years later. Mr. Helliwell, Mr. Brown, and Mr. Alden. And they were all English teachers. And they said, actually, you know, this guy who's come to us, this Anthony Horowitz, is not as useless as all his other teachers said. Maybe he can do something. He can write. And they encouraged me, and they began to show me great books to read, and they... and, and Thanks to their example, I found myself and found the writer in me, and, and that's what started me in my, in my life. So the answer to your question is yes, absolutely. A good teacher with the power that he or she has is one of the most important people in the world. Amazing. Um, Sonia Swabby, what a cool name. Uh, which character are you most proud of creating mm. and writing about? It's like naming your favourite child. No, it is difficult, Sonia. I mean, the, uh, which, which character am I most proud of? Yeah, not which I like the villains. The villains, are the, f the villains are the most fun to write. I love creating a good villain, and I love thinking up a memorable death in the last chapter so that you get the villain and you get the end and all that happens there. That's the most fun. The character I'm probably proudest of creating... Alex, it would have to be Alex Ryder. I mean, you know, I love Matt Freeman in the Gatekeeper series. I love Tim Diamond and Nick Diamond, my two funny detectives. I've written lots of stories about them too. But Alex is the one that changed my life. Alex is the one that sort of is known all over the world. And, and I suppose I'm proudest of having created him. Did he come from anywhere? Did you just pluck well, Alex he was, out? Well, I mean, he was this James Bond, but he was also, there was a boy I knew called Alex who came to tea with me. His parent was my best friend. And, and uh, this boy, he's, he uh, spoke French, because uh, his dad was French, and he played, uh, 
he was very good at taekwondo. He had a brown belt in taekwondo. And he had lots of the qualities of Alex Ryder. So I used a bit of him in the character. I use everything. I'll, I'll probably use you. Oh, brilliant. I'll certainly, I'm going to use that boy over there, the killer. I'm, the used, I'm, I'm going to use gonna, lots. I'm going to thwart his plans. There you go. The That's a story. OK, um, we're going to go to a question from... Is this a live question? We're going to go to our first live. Um, Mrs Bird has sent this one in on behalf of her school. Hi, Mrs Bird. The school just cheered really loudly then, didn't it? <laughs> um, what advice would you give to anyone aged 10 who is passionate about being a writer? Um, OK, advice for would-be writers. Um, shame we can't put the photograph of Mrs Bird up behind as we speak. But never mind. Well, next time. Um, here's my advice. Read. The more you read, the better you write. Write. The more you write, a little bit every day. It gets better with practice. The most important advice, have fun, have adventures, go out, do something illegal, don't get caught. But you've got to have, you've got to have something to write about. If you, don't, you know, if you don't take risks, and I know, you know, Barney, you're always doing all sorts of crazy things, flying planes and Formula One racing cars, you've got tons to write about. So get out and have adventures is the third thing. The fourth thing I've already said now, when I was talking earlier about being rejected to Sonia's question, which is you've got to believe in yourself. Writing is a lonely business. You know, I'd spend 15 hours a day sometimes in a room by myself because, you know, writing, you're always alone. So you have to believe in yourself and, and believe in what you're writing. Uh, and that's very important for a writer. And the fifth and the most important thing in a way as well is enjoy it. If you're not enjoying your writing, something's gone wrong. You've got to enjoy it and have fun while you're writing. And then, then you know that, that that fun will get sort of, you know, it's infectious and people will enjoy reading it. Do you think it's hard when you know you've got to write something? You, you're in a position where you're, you're told by... These, uh, these demons to write of these Of course, if, you, if a teacher tells you to, you know, you've got 30 minutes to write about, I don't know, what I did yesterday or, 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 or an event or something, or, or something, that's much, much more difficult. Writers don't just sit down and turn a button on and write, but yeah. that's school, you know, that's a different tune. You've got to learn somewhere, and, and at school you learn things like grammar and spelling and how to write and how to come up with ideas and how to structure. That's important too, but it is, of course, in a way, much more difficult for you to write than it is for me. I do it for fun, it's my living, it's what I do all the time. You do it because you're told to, some of you. So that's, that's harder. OK. Another live question here from Sandback High Schools, for girls, hi girls. Um, Eve, Susanna, Anna and Chloe, how long does it take you to write each book? And uh, which book took you the longest to write? Oh, gosh. Um, well... As I've said, each book is approximately one year. It's very, very hard to know because I work such long days. You know, 15 hours a day is a lot, of, a lot of time, but then on other days I don't do any work at all. I'll, you know, go to a cinema, go on holiday, or, or, or just, you know, have a rest. So it's very difficult to tell how long a book uh, takes. Um, the one that probably took me the longest would have been a book I wrote called The Devil and His Boy. It's the only book I've ever written for history teachers and for kids who like history. This is set in the Elizabethan age. And because I knew nothing about history, I had to spend a lot of time researching it. You know, I wrote the first draft, then I took out the motor cars, for example, yeah. uh, because I didn't have them in Elizabethan times. But it was fun. You know, I could write, instead of writing gunfights, I wrote sword fights. And instead of car chases, I had horse chases. And so it was quite a fun book to write, but it did take a long time to, to do. Brilliant. Who says you can't enjoy writing a story? If you're going to write a story about going to Moscow, you've got to go to Moscow to research you. That's just the law. Exactly. Um, Luke Cartwright, and lots of other people in brackets, it's a very popular question. Do you have any tips for planning good stories? What makes a good story? OK, Luke, a good story starts just simply with a, with a, with a, a little idea. You know, every single thing you do in life, there are ideas attached to it. I mean, for example, what we're doing now, this very minute, I could think of all sorts of stories that we could just fix on to what's happening right now. For example, it's very interesting. I've thought of this before, but actually at this moment, this is the perfect moment for a murder to take place in a school. Why? Because everybody is looking this way. Nobody in the class, I imagine at this moment, is looking behind them. So who knows what's happening at the back of the class? Or it could be a romance, you know. Uh, what is your teacher doing right at this moment? And who is she or he doing it with? Behind you, it's, a, it's, it's just a question. I'm not... <laughs> I'm not suggesting anything amiss. Any teachers shift uncomfortably. I am not suggesting sense. anything amiss. I'm merely pointing out that the nature of what we're doing now suggests itself that there are stories. Who is watching us at this very moment? Now, you said 500 schools. How are you so sure that all of those schools are on this planet? If we wanted to write a science fiction story, we could have a school from Mars watching us at this moment and planning something. I don't know. What's happening? Where are we? What's happening behind the screen? What you're watching here is sheer genius at work, by the way. <laughs> uh, Anthony came onto Blue Peter a few weeks ago, and on a live show, we, get, we had ideas that were fed in by a live audience, and you wrote a story on the spot from ideas that were given in. But do you think that's because you're just naturally good at writing stories? I mean, does everybody have that ability to take ideas and create a story like Anthony Horowitz would? I think that all writers... I think if, if you want to be a writer in your life, 
You don't look at what's shown to you right in front of you. You always look at what's just out of sight, what's just out of view. So where does that door go to? What's underneath this floor? You know, what's behind the camera? Who is that cameraman? Are we sure he is a cameraman? Uh, you know, he's pointing this big object at me. Are we sure it's a camera? I hope so. Uh, otherwise, we're sort of wasting our time a bit. But, you know, it's all that sort of thing. You ask questions. Now, I think that, that if there are people, and is there anybody in this audience here in, in London who wants to be a writer? So a few hands going straight up there, and I bet you're the same as me, that you just daydream. And if a teacher tells you you're daydreaming in class, just say you're working on your next novel. That's what I'd say anyway. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, because, you know, that is what it's about a little bit. It's about just letting your imagination roam. Now, I forgot what the original question from Luke was, but mm -hmm. have I answered it? What was the original question from Luke? Never mind. We it sort of answered it, I think. Yeah. It, was, it was to do with where do the ideas come from, how long do they take to That's write right. as yeah, well. That was a girl's, yeah. I get loads and loads of ideas. Sometimes I get 20 ideas in one day, and the secret of, of my life is to know which is the idea that's just silly, throw it away, forget about it, yeah. and which is the idea that just won't stop, the idea that has to be written. Teenage Spy, that was just a little idea, but I didn't let it go away. It stayed, it grew, and it blossomed, and it became a book, then a series, and a film, and all the rest of it. So that's the secret, is to know which idea. A, a book can be a year of your life. You know, it's, 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 it's a year to write, and then it's another year, actually, for the publishers to make it into a book and to put it into the shops and, and all the rest of it. That's two years. You've got to be sure that it's a great idea to make it worth um, your time and, and to be sure that it'll, you know, and sell and make people happy and they'll read it and like it. Amazing. Um, Diana would like to know, how relevant were your English lessons to you? You've, you've spoken about your teachers, but did you find any part of them useful um, or did they hamper your progress? Listen, every single person in this room, every single person watching this program has a talent. Now, because kids these days are so much cleverer than I ever was, they probably have 10 talents or 15 talents. But when I was a boy, I was no good at anything very much. I mean, I was bad at pretty much every single subject in school. Uh, my worst subject was probably French or maths. I was very, very bad at maths. Geometry. Did you ever do geometry where you have to do all triangles and rectangles? We did cosine I, and oh, I couldn't understand stuff. any yeah, of that like stuff. That. I was so bad at geometry that when I was told to stand in the corner, I couldn't find it. That's how bad I was. I mean, it's, <laughs> and, um, uh, <laughs> the one subject at school that I was good at was English. That was because that's a question. What was English like for me? And English was the one lesson I looked forward to. And I think one of the reasons I looked forward to it was because, first of all, I was allowed to write stories. In fact, I was told to write stories, and I used to love it. And I always wrote the story I wanted to write. So if it was the story was, what did you do on your holidays? If I wanted to write about, I don't know, space exploration, I'd say I went to, I'd, I went to an you know, I went to Mars. I'd, you know, I'd make it all up uh, because that was the fun of it. Um, and English to me also was a chance to read. You know, we read lots of books. I didn't love reading. Don't get this idea that I was some kind of smarty pants who wrote, you know, who read Charles Dickens when I was 12. Not a bit of it. I was quite slow, but I just loved stories. I loved reading and turning pages and books. It was my life. So yes, English lessons were for me the big, big salvation. And that was the one lesson in school that I always knew that I would do well at. And, and, I, and, I, and I did. It's great to be this far down the line and still have the excitement in your voice about it. It's something you obviously remember, uh, remember quite fondly. You can see the the audience here getting exciting too, just listening to what you're saying. Well, you see I the hope smile so. I think that's talking, look, the secret about, you know, what, what am I doing this for? Why am I talking to you today? Why are you here? Why am I talking to all of the uh, schools who've, who so kindly joined in this session? It's not about selling my books or about myself or about me. It's about reading and about books and about the excitement that they have. And you know, you, what you get is, you get grown-ups talking to you the whole time, oh, you should read this, you must read that, and all the rest of it. And I think what they forget is that actually, yes, reading is good for you. Yes, reading helps you to be more articulate, reading takes you on wonderful adventure but that the main point is that reading is fantastic fun you can go to places and meet people and do things and see things in books that you might never ever do in life and that's why I love books so much so it's not really about being educational it's not really about my books it's just about sharing with this audience and with that audience something that I love well, one adventure that's happening right now is a trip to Sadler's Wells Theatre in London to meet the amazing Anthony Horowitz we have another question from our audience uh, is it Misha at Churchill Gardens Primary? Misha or Misha? Hiya, Misha, hello. Hi, um, my question is, do you have any experiences like Alex Ryder during your childhood? Um, gosh, Misha, did I have any experiences like Alex Ryder in my childhood? You know, this is a question I sort of dread. Because Alex is so cool and he's so exciting, he has so many adventures and so much, you know, happens that's exciting. Whereas I just sit in a room writing and I'm sort of just this man. So I'm much less interesting in a way than Alex. But I did have some adventures when I was young. You know, as I said in the early, to the question I was asked earlier about getting out and having fun, having adventures, that's what I did. And, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to travel all around the world. I've had all sorts of different jobs, some of them 
quite dangerous. I worked as a, a cowboy for a time. As, you which were was, a cowboy. Yeah, I was a cow Believe it or not, I actually was a cowboy for a while. That's amazing. What, you, you I'm the, the, the only children, I'm the only writer for young people you'll ever meet who, given a penknife and a cow, could turn it into every single steak. I did it. It was extraordinary. That's amazing. You know, fillet, service, if, 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 um, if the writing ever dries up, I could become a butcher. If only we had something. a cow to demonstrate this writing. Oh, uh, well, we got my editor somewhere, but no, not the same idea at all. Sure. Um, uh, so, no, I mean, I did try and have fun, and, and, and I did try to get into danger. Because danger, and you know, I travelled, I travelled through Iran and Pakistan and Afghanistan, all these places when they were not as dangerous as they are now, but they were still dangerous then. And I remember, you know, going into places I wasn't allowed to go, always in disguise, because when you were out there, being Jewish myself, I wasn't allowed into some of the mosques and everything, but I still wanted to see them. So almost like Alex Ryder, I would disguise myself. I was very dark at that time, and I'd put a cloth across my face and a, you know, dish dash, uh, so I'd look Arabic, and I'd sneak into these places. And they were, it was dangerous, but it was exciting and fun. And you can bring that to your books with the Alex Ryder series. I could do, yeah. It was a bit. I, I was about seventeen at that time, so it was sort of the same sort of idea. So you could take those experiences and bring them into. The yeah, of course. I, I write about them now. I think Brilliant. you know a lot of what I do is imagined, but I think it's it's great fun also to go out and actually have the adventures. I'm not suggesting to anybody putting yourselves into danger, but I am saying it is fun sometimes to just live a little on the edge. Amazing. Thank you for your question, Richard. Um, we're going to go to our live audience. Hello, live audience. Um, Halen's Primary School, Isla White, what a place. Uh, which of the gadgets, yes, this is my type of question, which of the gadgets that you've written about would you most like to own in real life? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, I lovely to talk to the Isle of Wight. I used to go there an awful lot to Ventnor, which I, I loved, and, the, and I used to have very happy times out there. I don't know if that's where you are, but it's a great place to live. Um, what sort of gadget would I like, most like to have? I think my favourite gadget in all the Alex Ryder books happens in Archangel, and it's, it's insect cream. And the funny thing about the insect cream is it doesn't repel them, it attracts them. And, and Alex uses that. Have any of you any of you in this room read that book? Oh, a few hands going up, a few hands here and there. Anyway, um, Alex manages to spray one of the soldiers or guards with it, and immediately 10,000 mosquitoes and blue bottles and wasps and hornets come and chase it. There are so many people I could use that on. <laughs> I can think of all my old teachers for a start. But uh, yeah, th that's probably my favorite gadget. The thing about the Alex Ryder gadgets is they're always believable. I don't know what you think, but I thought the James Bond film that had an invisible car slightly spoiled it because we know that a car can't be invisible. Yeah. So if you don't believe the gadget, how can you believe the rest of the story? So that was one of the, 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 the gadgets I didn't like. And I, and, and I have never had um, an unbelievable gadget in my books, and I've never had lethal ones. Gadgets that kill people aren't so much fun. So that's the other gadget I've never had. Yeah. The, the, the other gadget I've always liked is that Alex at one stage has a little um, earring that he wears, an ear stud and it pulls apart to become a bomb when you put it back together again. I always liked it because I wanted my son to get his ear pierced, which he always yeah. refused to do. So I used to tiptoe into his bedroom when he was about nine or 10 with a hammer and nail, which I thought I'd do it, <laughs> do it, do it myself, but sadly he always woke up before I got there. Yeah, that, uh, would, that would be terrifying. Um, <laughs> anybody here got a favorite gadget from one of Anthony's books? Yes. Oh, the bubble gum in, in our... That's in point blank, I think, the bubble gum turns up. And it's the best thing about the bubble gum, which is you chew it, and when you stick it to something, and then it blows up. But the best thing about it was the name, Bubble 07. Oh, hey. yes. Absolute genius. Anybody else favourite gadgets? One down here? It's a pen bomb. Pen bomb? Pen bomb? Oh, I can't even remember that one. You can write on it, and it blows up. Did I make that up, or did you make that up? <laughs> I can't remember. There have been so many gadgets. It's a great... OK. If it, isn't, if it isn't in a book, it should be, but I think it probably is. I've written a lot of gadgets. Fabulous. Thank you very much for that question. Um, Regina Van Driel. That's an amazing name. Another great name. Look, you make these names up. No, Regina Van Driel. That's a great name. Beautiful for a beautiful name. Yeah. It's another bad Lovely guy. Name. Um, since you wrote an entire book about Yasin, is there any way that in the future you would write a book about Alex's parents? No, I'm not going to write any more books about Alex Ryder or his yes. parents or his... his friends or his relations or anything more. You know, there, there are nine, ten books now in the Alex Ryder series, um, or, uh, you know, Stormbreaker, Point Blank, etc., etc. And I think I've just done enough. I, you know, the difficult thing about being a writer is moving on. You've got to keep moving, keep, keep doing... New, you know, this is more advice for young writers. Don't stick doing the same thing over and over again. Writing is an adventure. Writing is a journey. So just keep doing new things and exploring new things. And I feel that with Alex, I've sort of... Done enough. You know, there are ten books out there with, with um, Russian roulette now. That, that sort of completes the circle, as it were. That's a whole series finished. And, uh, and that's time to stop. But I have other books to write, and, 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 and we'll do them. And we can't wait to see them. Um, we have a book question from Julie Hudson. How important are school libraries? 
in today's rapidly growing digital world. Because everything's oh, accessible. Oh, interesting. Isn't it, Julie Hudson, is she a librarian or is she a student, do we think? It's a great name for a student if it is. I think well, whether, she's a, whether she's a librarian or a teacher or student, I will say this, and I've said it many times. The most important room in any school is the library. You may not believe me, but I swear to you, the library is the beating heart of the school. It's where everything begins. A library connects every single classroom because no matter what your interest is, I mean, if, for example, you know, if you like science, for example, you can read the itch books. If you like sports, you can read Malpeet. If you like history, there's Terry Deary. If you like, you know, science or science fiction, whatever, there's something for everybody there. And, you know, if your school is going to be encouraged to read, then it's got to have a, 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 a lot of books. And I also think that every single school in the country should have a librarian, a, a librarian who knows the books, yeah. who knows the teachers, who knows the children, who can say, not just come and read a book, but can say, you know, I think you'd like this book because it really, you know, it'll suit you because I know you and such. So, I, you know, I could recommend all sorts of books for you, Barney, knowing you as a, you know, very adventurous sort who sort of likes speed and excitement. I'd recommend Alex Ryder, now I think about it. <laughs> but, you know... now in paperback, yeah. <laughs> But you know what I mean? A li so the answer to the question is, is yes, libraries are underrated in this country. I think they should have more money, more books, and, and more librarians, and they should be in every school. Uh, it should be obligatory that every school has both a, a very full library and a very uh, highly paid and, and uh, experienced yeah, librarian. Julie loves that comment. Um, it's a, you just opened a memory of mine from years ago. I had a teacher called Mr. Ede. It's mm -hmm. funny how you remember names, isn't it? And in my library, we had a noisy day in the library. You were allowed to be as noisy as you, as you wanted to be, but you had to act a scene out of the book. So you pick your favourite book and we could act out the scene in the library. It was that one way to be rebellious. I say actually. all power to Mr E. What a great idea. He really was. Um, we're going to get a question now from Maple Class, Forster Park. Hi, guys. Um, how did you learn about MI6 and spy facts for the story? Well, I mean, I did speak to agents who work for MI6. I'm not going to say that what's in Alex Ryder books is the truth, but I did speak to somebody who worked for MI6 in Hong Kong, and he told me an awful lot about what he got up to, and a lot of it was pretty nasty, I have to tell you. It wasn't how sort of fun. you know you're not being watched fun. right now? We almost certainly are being watched right okay. now, Barney, if we start talking about MI6. Okay. Warning bells go over government offices. Stop this. <laughs> Close this down now. But no, I, I did a little bit of research. And, and what I found out wasn't really suitable for the books. The books are fun. They want to be adventures. A lot of what these people do in these offices is pretty nasty. Mm. Say no more. Uh, every, I'm every, not going to add anything to every that. Every answer is a cliffhanger. Uh, live question from Phoebe. Hi, Phoebes. It's my favourite name. Uh, where did you get the names for the chapters? Because they're so good. Oh, chapter names. Well, chapter names. I mean, like, titles and chapter names are not easy. You know, when you're, when you're writing a book, you've got to... What's the first thing you see in a book? It's a title. It's, it's a, you know, a, a title is what sells the book and makes you open it and read the first sentence and gets you into the book. Yes. So, for example, a book like Russian Roulette, if it was called sort of um, the, the End of Communism in 2002, which is actually sort of one tiny part of what's in the book, Who'd read it? It would be boring. Russian Roulette, which I don't know if you know this, but Russian Roulette is one of the most dangerous games you can play, yeah. where you point a loaded gun at your own head, it's got one bullet in, and click, 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 and if you're, unlu if you're unlucky, bang. Um, that, that's a, to me, was a good title. And, and all the titles are chosen very carefully. Stormbreaker, that's the name of a computer. And it's storm, electricity, power. Breaker, you break codes like a computer does. Genius. Point blank, it's actually a play on words. Point blank is like that, close to you. But point blank is also point blanc, it's the name of a mountain. Eagle strike, it's a bird and a strike is a punch. So you look for that, chapter headings are the same. Every chapter heading is saying to the reader, Read this chapter. Don't stop now. Don't go and play on your, you know, your computer. Don't go and, and do social networking. Stay reading. A chapter is an invitation to read the next, the next chunk of words. So the chapters have to work hard. And I, and I always try and find titles that sort of just, you know, just make you want to read a little bit more. Things that go bump in the night type. So that's one of the chapters in this one I just happened to notice. So uh, that's a sort of chapter heading I like. Just something that says, read me. Things that go bump in the night. It's normally a father with a hammer and a nail, I imagine. Or looking to try and get his kid with a pierced ear. Yes, that would probably do it. Uh, if you're wondering what's happening right now, you're watching us live from Sadler's Wells Theatre in London, and you're watching a masterclass in how to take your own imagination and turn it into a creative story with Anthony Horowitz, the main man. Um, this is probably the best question in 17 years of being in telly that I've okay. ever asked to anybody. Alison Chalmers, really going for the deep and the nitty gritty here, Anthony. I'm... Take your time for this one. Okay. What's your favourite pie? <laughs> <laughs> It's a genuine question. It's is that really on. true? Yes. Somebody wanted to know that. What is your favourite pie? My favourite pie. And why is it your favourite pie? What's your favourite pie? Steak and ale. Steak and because ale? Because I remember my granddad eating it when I was little. And I remember when he used to eat, uh, get a little spoonful of his steak on my plate, even though I wasn't ah, supposed to well, eat it. Well, first of all, okay, first of all, pie or pudding? 
Oh, okay. You see, I prefer puddings. They, who likes, have you ever, who's had steak and kidney pudding? I mean, I put the sun on it. suet pudding, down. you know, with that thick crust. You know, it's, maybe this is a grown up thing. Only the teachers in the middle here either, are confessing to their love of steak and kidney pudding. Isn't it we have something house? in common. I'll see you afterwards, seven o'clock. I know a little place down the road. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I'd go for steak. Funny enough, steak and kidney pudding I love. Although kidneys are revolting. Yeah, Isn't that what kind of a lector eats kidneys? Yeah, not uh, but, but they're disgusting. But in a steak and kidney pudding, somehow I like those. So that would be one of my favourites. If it's a pie, I'd go for lemon meringue, I think. Oh, sweet. Lemon meringue pie I like, you know, with the fluffy white on the stuff on the top. Mm. So what has that got to do with books out of interest? I don't know. Maybe in the future there'll be books that you can eat that are made out of pastry. I don't know. It could go anywhere, couldn't it? That's an interesting idea. A um, book. Book. We've got uh, an audience question. Uh, is it Boran? Where's Boran? Hello, mate. Hi, Boran. And he's from Victoria Primary School, and this is his question. Um, what inspired you to be a writer? Wow. Oh, well, that's, I mean, how long have you got? The simple answer is, Boran, that I was no good at anything else. That's the honest truth. When I was at school, I was useless. I was bottom of every single class. My teachers thought I was hopeless. I used to get the world's worst reports. My uh, maths report, Anthony cannot multiply or divide. He will add up to very little. Uh, and my other one was if, uh, rel a religious, religious education, RE. Yep. Uh, if he worked, it would be a miracle. Uh, that was the sort of reports <laughs> I used to get. And um, I was no good at anything. But where I was at school, it was rather odd. I was at a boarding school. It was a, a horrible, horrible place. Uh, 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 to, to be in, place, uh, in, in North London. And um, we slept in dormitories, so eight boys to a room. And uh, at night, we were all lonely and scared. You have no idea what it's like to be in a boarding school. You're so lucky now to be... I don't think of myself as old until I talk to young people today and realise how much nicer and better so many schools are than when I was around. You know, no beatings and none of that sort of stuff and, and all the sort of bullying and horrible things that happened in my school. In the dormitory where we slept at night, eight little kids, all scared, I discovered that the only way to keep everybody happy was to tell them stories. And so, as a little kid of like 10 or 11 years old, I became a dormitory storyteller. Amazing. And you I were used making to, up yourself. I would make up a little bit like I'm doing here, except without the television cameras and the well known television celebrity and the studio and the theatre and everything else. I would just sit in bed and tell stories, normally about kids running away. Two little boys, Jimmy and Edward, they were called. They were always running away and having adventures, night after night after night. And every night at around about 10 o'clock, I'd get hoiked out by the teachers for talking after lights out, which was a punishment, stand in the corridor. But I, was, I never let it stop me because I just found I loved telling stories. And so that's how I became a writer. I just simply knew that that, that was what I wanted to do. And it's like I said earlier, I think everybody in life has a talent, has something that you, every one of you has something you love doing. And the secret of life, really, is to find out what it is and do it. It's as simple as that, really. You know, with you, it's sort of, you know, all the stuff you do on television as a presenter and also all the stuff you do in sort of high-speed cars and photography and all the other things you have, you've made that your life. And I'm sure, you know, do you have lots of other skills I don't know about? Or is it that you are following what you love to do best? I, I think you have to do what you love best. You know? well, that's, how I that's how I discovered I was a writer. I told stories and they worked and the other kids enjoyed them. It was what I loved doing and so there was no other choice. There was nothing else I could do instantly. I couldn't earn money any other way than I, than I do selling. I have no other skills. There's always been a part of Alex Ryder in you from being a young age as well. I mean, to be in a dormitory like that at eight years old, telling stories, is kind of a survival technique as well, isn't it? You're I sort think of that is true. You know, I think also schools can be quite tough places. And if you're not very confident, you've got to find a way of, you know, I've always said to my kids when they, when they went to school, I said, be good at sport or be funny. Yeah. And if you're one or the other, you'll be fine. Yeah. Oh, and one of my kids is good at sport, and one's funny, so they're okay. A funny football would be a good idea. Playing with a trifle instead of a football, that's oh. a funny game. <laughs> um, a question from Molly. In Russian Roulette, you tell the story of how someone turns bad. Do you believe that nature or nurture has a larger influence Whoa. on who someone turns out to be? Fantastic you, question. That's a very complicated question. I don't know if you can follow that in this audience, but nature or nurture. Do we, go, do we do bad things because we're born bad, or is it that our family and our circumstances make us bad? It's a great question. I don't know, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, Yasin Grigorovich turns bad because of what happens to him, and what happens to him is connected to Alex Ryder and Alex Ryder's parents, and there's this whole history that sort of seems almost to manipulate him and turn him bad. You know, he's a good kid at the start of the book. I couldn't have written this book if he hadn't been somebody you were excited by. Instead, I should not mention that this book is a thriller. The way we've been talking about it, it sounds like a sort of a, you know, psycho psychological tract. It's not. It's a fun, fast-paced thriller. But that said, 
I think that we all have choices. My belief is that, if, I've said this already, the people in this room choose what they're going to be. And I don't believe that your circumstances necessarily make you an evil or a bad person. I, you can't believe that. You've got to start by believing that all young people are good. All young people are the same in a way. They've all got the same opportunities, the same chances of succeeding in life of a child or, or not. Obviously, you know, there are social things that are, that are unfair in this country, and some kids get so many more chances than others. But the truth is, I believe, that if you do read, and if you do sort of, you know, enjoy school, and if you do sort of work, God, I'm sounding like a rabid old conservative, but I'm not really, but I just do believe that all young people have the opportunity to be anything they want to be, and that, that it's in them, and that you just have to grasp it. I look at myself, I have said I was stupid. I really was not a clever kid. And I, obviously, I had a very privileged upbringing, but nonetheless, the writing came from somewhere else. And so I just like to believe... I don't think you can write books for young people unless you believe in young people. And you can but, tell by the certain character that you are, you're nothing but encouraging and inspiring. I hope so. Sitting here as a 30-something person, I'm I hope inspired. Kind of, 30-something. Oh, you're... I'll still be <laughs> happening after this amount of time, Anthony. Um, we're going to go to uh, Manav at Lordswood Boys' School. It's a live question. Hello, live person. It's like there's people that are watching that aren't live. It's a bit of a strange thing to say. Um, out of all the books you've written, oh, again, which is your favourite? It's a very tough one, isn't it? You've done so many. Oh, you know, when you ask... The, I'm asked that question, you know, what is my favourite book? I say, you know, sometimes I say Stormbreaker because Stormbreaker was the first Alex Ryder book yeah. and, and it began the whole series. Sometimes I say Scorpio, which is the fifth Alex Ryder book because most kids who've read it say that that's the best in the series. And it is, I think, probably, it has many things in it that are the best. But then there's a book I wrote called The Switch, which nobody's ever heard of, but it's in, sort of, it's in bookshops somewhere. And it's the last book I wrote before Alex Ryder. And I'm very fond of that book because it built a bridge to Alex Ryder. And there are things in the book which... Anyone here read The Switch? You see, not one... For those watching, not one single hand has gone up when I asked that question. But it is, in a funny way, my favourite book. So, you know, I, I try to like all my books. But if I had to choose one, Stormbreaker. It would have to be Stormbreaker. OK. See how much more difficult that was than the pie? <laughs> So That's why the pie keep, question was Ask genius. me more questions about pies. I can, I can tell you anything about pies. What's your favourite sauce to go with your favourite pie? We can take oh, it okay. doing. Um, Bedford Girls School, Class 5A. Hello. Hello, Hi, Class 5A. Uh, we're going to a live question. Roald Dahl wrote in a shed. That's a statement. And where do you write? I write everywhere. I write everywhere, anywhere. I write on buses, I write on trains. But when I'm in London, and I live about five minutes away from where we are now, I have the top floor, which is a, which is a very long, narrow room, and it looks out over St Paul's Cathedral, and I Beautiful. can see the old Bailey down there, and I can sort of... I can see lots of buildings all around, and that's my office, that's where I work. Uh, I go quite a lot to a place called Orford in Suffolk, which is sort of where I go to hide at weekends or weeks, whenever I can get away, where I, there's a tiny little sort of almost... It's not quite a shed, but it's a little wooden construction on the quay down there and I could look out at the river and, and I love being there too. But by and large I write everywhere and anywhere. Um, you know, yesterday I was on a, on, a, on a train coming to London and I was just writing because, you know, every, every minute counts. Do you look past instant inspiration? So if you're sat at home and you're saying um, there was a man and he met a lady at... You look up and go, St Paul's Cathedral. No, it's not like you... that at all, no. I mean, the books are already planned in my head. I'm, I'm writing... To, writing is not just about sitting at a desk writing. Writing is about meeting people. Writing is about thinking up ideas. Writing is about having fun and excitement and adventure. And, and writing is about absorbing things and storing them. And then you sit down finally somewhere and it all comes out onto the paper. So, you know, the, the, the bit of the office bit, the bit by myself, which is, in a, in a way, the bit I like least sometimes because I'm so, you know, I get lonely. It's yeah. sort of not nice. Um, writers are very isolated people, by and large. Um, so, so that's often not the best bit. The best bit is actually meeting people and having the, having the experiences. Fabulous. Uh, Lucy Young says, if you had not been so successful in writing, what else would you have done? Well, I sort of answered that, really. You know, the only other job I would like if I wasn't a writer... I'd like to be a teacher, because I think it must be such fun, to, I'm not if I'm wrong, but it must be such fun to see young people developing and growing up and knowing that you're helping them to sort of steering them towards the rest of their life. That must be the reward. I mean, it isn't the money, is it? So it must be, <laughs> that must be the reward of teaching, must be something like that. Who would like uh, to have Anthony as their teacher? <laughs> hands in the air. Oh, it's so hands in the air, but on the other yeah. hand, on the other hand, you've only got me here for one hour. And so no matter how boring this is or how fun it is or whatever it is, it's over in an hour, you go back. 
but you have your teacher every single day of the week, you know, at school for sort of week after week. It's much, much harder being a writer, uh, being a teacher, sorry, than doing what I'm doing now today because I only have to do it once. And I'm doing it to 500 schools at once at the same time. Who Th are all very excited that you're here. And I have to show you what's just come up onto the screen okay. here. I'm going to show it to you and I'll read it out to you as well. Oh, look, at what, um, look at what Amelia Adamson has written. You were talking about your favourite book. And that's what they say at the top. Oh, well, this is St. Wilfred's School. Thank you to St. Wilfred's School. They say we love the switch. Well, They've they read it to the school. So look, there you are. Most of you in this audience who haven't read it, and I didn't come here to try and sell my books, honestly. <laughs> uh, but there is one I recommend, the switch. Thank you for that. That's really nice. Brilliant. Um, Mr. Fitzpatrick and many others. A great name for a teacher, that. Um, sometimes our children in year six experience a little bit of writer's block. Oh, writer's block. Yeah, I so, know that feeling. Um, so what tips can you give them to deal with it when it happens? It's difficult. I mean, if you're at school, and you know what writer's block is, don't you? It's when you sit there and you've got you've been told to write something and you've got like 40 minutes to write it and you can't think of a single idea and you just begin to panic and freeze. Now when that happens to me, I go to the cinema or I go swimming or I take I go out for a walk. You can't do that at school, clearly. So what do you do? I think the answer is, is first of all, don't panic. You know, just don't worry. Five minutes spent just thinking pleasantly, relax, sort of just, you know, mulling it over and maybe doodling a little bit and just dro dropping down a few ideas. That's what helps. I think the moment you get fixated, oh my God, oh my God, I've only got, f you know, 20 minutes left to write this, what am I going to do? Your brain freezes and you can't, you can't get it, you can't do anything. So my answer to the question is, is look out the window. See what's out the window. Look at a picture in the room. Pictures are a fantastic inspiration, Cindy. Whenever I get stuck, I look at a picture that's on the wall and I imagine what's happening in that picture. So if it's a landscape, you know, what's going on behind that tree? What's underneath the grass? It's the same sort of technique of just looking around corners. Or if it, you're in a school, just look around you at what's in the class and wonder where things came from. Who put them there? Everything in life has a story. These rather bizarre chairs that we're sitting on even now. I wonder what maniac thought them up. I mean, it's sort of, you know, such a, this big red, like it's a slice of tomato chair. My bottom it, has gone numb. It, oh, mine too. I mean, I've been sitting here wondering how long it will be before I get feelings back in my legs again. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And so let your mind wander yeah. and then come back and the block hopefully would have gone. Fabulous. I think these chairs actually turn into a flying carpet. That's they how could we, be. That's how we're going to leave. I think that's what they'd be. Yeah, they were flying carpet before they were chairs. It's possible. Um, we're going to go to an audience question. Um, is it Akila? Hi, Akila from Oaks Park School. Hiya. Hi. My question is, um, are any of the characters in Russian roulette based on anyone you know, e.g. family, friends, etc.? Well, that's a good question. Thank you very much, Akila. Um, well, first of all, Jasen Gregorovich himself. I met somebody when I was doing a, a book signing in Sweden, and he was an illustrator of children's books. And I asked him his name, and he said, it's Jasen Gregorovich. And I said, gosh, with a name like that, you should be an assassin. And of course, now he is. I mean, you know, that's one of the fun things. So he was based on somebody I met. Um, Sharkovsky, who is the very, very evil Russian who, um, who um, kidnaps Yasin when he's a boy and such, is based on sort of a real person out of the newspapers. I won't say who, because he has lots of lawyers. Uh, and one has to be very careful. Not, you know, when you're writing a book, if you put somebody in a book, you've got to be very careful they don't sue you in court, because it can be very expensive and difficult. Or if they're a Russian oligarch, they might just shoot you, which is sort of even worse. Um, so, and, and I mean, the the other characters in it? No, not really. I mean, when I was writing the book, I went to Russia. I met lots of people, and they told me their stories. So when you read the early parts of the book, there are things in there which are completely extraordinary, which you won't believe. For example, at your school, do they teach you how to dismantle and reconstruct an AK-47 automatic machine gun? Believe it or not, believe it or not, in Russia in 1999, kids who went to school learned how to do that. And I spoke to somebody about that, and he told me that's what they did, so I put it into the book. Uh, I, I was told this story about some guy who lived in an, a, a village in Russia where everybody was so bored, they used to drink vodka, vodka, vodka all the time. And his neighbour, who was a farmer, passed out one day. Unfortunately, it snowed that day, and by the end of the day, he was frozen solid under a little clump of snow. I put that in the book, too. This is all real it's life. All really real. Russian roulette is full of truth because when you're writing fantasy and fiction, although I don't put people into my books exactly, I often use things that I'm told. So people who tell me things and stories that I hear, they make the books more credible, more believable, and that's important because this is an adventure, this book. It's a sort of a fast-paced adventure, but it's got to feel real. So I met people and their stories went into the book, but they didn't. Yeah, we'll point out they're not really evil people that you know. They're normal people that have... The people I met in Russia were very nice people, but they yeah. had lived this extraordinary life. You know, when you were very young, living in England, 
They were living without water. There was no water in their houses sometimes. The toilets were still outside. The old grandmother in chapter 2, who sleeps in the wall above the fire, that was told to me. It was a real grandmother. So, you know, it's, it's the little stories like that that make it, make it come to life. It's nothing short of inspiring, Anthony, and we have get so many questions that are coming through. We're going to try and get as many uh, as we can today. Let's go straight to uh, a live question. Uh, do you have any hobbies? That's from Manish at Lordswood Boys School. I don't really have hobbies, no, because the truth is I just don't have time for hobbies. I mean, I, I, I do certain things. I mean, I go to the cinema and the theatre. I try to walk every day because I want to keep myself fit as best I can. I used to go to the gym a lot, but I haven't been for a while. Um, I do have one or two hobbies. I collect things, which is what people do. I collect little toys. I, I like them. magic tricks. Yeah. Um, I, I collect magic tricks. I never perform magic. I find magicians slightly creepy, but I do love magic uh, itself. I love, you know, sleight of hand and all that stuff. So occasionally I do that, but by and large, I'm too busy with my work and with my, you know, writing television, writing film, writing journalism and the books. It's just too much time to, to, to spend, to have hobbies. OK, another question from uh, Daniel Harris Goff School, another live question. Hiya. Um, if you were to make a character based on yourself, brilliant, um, how would you describe that character? Oh, Daniel Harris Goff School, where's that I wonder? What a nice question. Anyway, thanks very much for that great question. As a matter of fact, I have already created a character based on myself, so I can answer that question very certainly for you. If you ever read the Diamond Brothers books, which has two characters, Nick Diamond, who is 13 years old and is, is very, very clever, and he has an older brother, 25 years old, Tim Diamond, who is completely thick and Tim Diamond is a detective but he's such a stupid detective that he can't even find a fingerprint at the end of his own finger that sort of thing he's, he's a really stupid detective and that character's me Tim Diamond was based on me if you read the description of him which is dark with brown eyes and everything he looks a bit like me and, and, and when I created the character it was two sides of my character uh, Tim Diamond is me as I am Nick Diamond is me as I wish I was. And so those two characters came from me. Amazing. Great question. Um, uh, another live question coming in. Um, any second now? Um, are you a Holmes or a Watson? Wow. That's an interesting question. I wonder if that was a teacher's Kim. question or a, or a student's question. Am I a Holmes or a Watson? Or a Moriarty. The, oh, yeah. Which, as it happens, uh, yes, I mean, uh, is the title of my next book, as it happens. But, um... I think I'm probably a, oh, what a tricky one. If I say Holmes, I'm going to sound arrogant and conceited because he's so clever. But if I say Watson, I suppose I'm a bit of both, really. I'm Watson because I write, and I'm Holmes because I think up crimes. So I'm a bit of both. Excellent. Um, good Miss, question. It's Very a great good question. question. Um, I've Miss never Stormy. been asked that before, either. It's a good question because it, it does basically give both sides of the yeah, character, doesn't it? Uh, Miss Story and ATC, this is another live question. Uh, if you could choose one thing to take on a desert island, what would it be? Now, my answer to this is always a boat. <laughs> well, I was on a programme called Desert Island Discs many years ago, and Great I wanted program. to take my dog, right. but they wouldn't let me. So I said, I'll take my dog and I'll have him stuffed, because they wouldn't let him be, would come when he was alive. So I'd say, my what dog's stuffed. What a weird stuffed. stipulation. Why can't you have a live No, you can't have any companionship on this island. But that, in this question, I know... On Desert Island Discs, I chose pen and paper, but I know what I'd choose now, because just when we were in the, in the room outside before this programme began, Barney showed me this miniature hovercraft. Oh, it's amazing. Which you can get, and You've it's not get even one. terribly expensive. And I thought, that's what I'll have my desert island, because I can go whizzing around the island a few times to amuse myself, and when I get bored, I'm off into the distance. I am going to put you in touch with those people. You need to get no, your I'm hovercraft. No, I'm getting Everyone kidding. should have a miniature hovercraft. I've um, decided. We've got a question here from the children from Scott Home Primary School. Hi, guys. Uh, what book would you like to turn into a film or TV series? So what other book, I guess? OK, well, that, the answer to that's easy as well. Thanks for the question. Um, I've written another series of books called The Gatekeeper Series, um, The Power of Five, it's also called. It's Raven Gate, Evil Star, Night Rise, Necropolis, and Oblivion. These, anyone here read that series? Anyone know that series? A f no, yeah. not so many hands go up, a few. It's a scarier, darker sequence, the Annex Rider, and I would love to see the first one, Ravensgate, filmed. It's set in Yorkshire, it's um, about witches and nuclear power stations, and it's about um, these five children. It's a bit like, if you know the Lord of the Rings, the Tolkien books, the Lord of the Rings, but it's the Lord of the Rings set in the real world. Wow. And it's the idea, it's the same thing I was talking about, of not ever knowing what's going on, except looking behind things. The idea is, is that, you know, devils and demons and witches and monsters can be fighting, but not on some kind of foreign planet, but in London, in Yorkshire, in Hong Kong, all over the world. And it's about five children who find themselves fighting these monsters. And the books get bigger and bigger and longer and longer and more and more violent as they continue. Not that violent, but quite dark. Yeah. So Raven's Gate is the first one, and it's the easiest one to read, and that's one I'd like to see filmed. 
What do you think about the way books are portrayed in movies? Because obviously when you read a book, it's your own imagination, it's your own place that you take yourself to, and it's largely down to the reader. When you have a movie, it's kind of a set image in a set place with a set character, and everyone sees the same thing. How do well, you think about it? You put your finger on a very good point. When you read books, and this is why reading is so good for you, when you read, you're doing something incredibly creative. Honestly, trust me. People talk about reading as being something you do in your leisure time, something you do for fun, for pleasure. Well, it is fun, it is pleasure, but at the same time, it is a fantastic act of imagination to take a book, to take the words on a page, and to create from those words, first of all, cities. I mean, in the cities, houses and temples and other sorts of buildings. And in those buildings, characters, all walking, talking, living, breathing, interacting. That's what you're doing when you read a book. You are God creating a universe. And it's a fantastic experience. Now, a Hollywood producer with $100 million can do sort of the same job on a screen, but that producer will never do it quite as well as you do it for yourself. And that's the reason why so many books, not all books, but so many books, don't work on the screen. I thought the Percy Jackson books, which I love, weren't so great on the film. I thought Stormbreaker didn't work as a film, despite Alex Pettifer, who was great. It still didn't work quite as well, I think, as the books. There are some exceptions. The Harry Potter books were filmed Brilliantly. I mean, they were fantastic, of course. And so were the Hunger Games films, numbers one and two, which were brilliantly done. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but by and large, films will disappoint because you don't create them yourself. Amazing. Just to let you know, we're getting thousands of questions coming through here. Oh, my really goodness. Can we extend in. for another two hours? I don't I, think if so. If you want to, yeah, why not? I don't think so. Um, I've got a hovercraft Let's device. Let's throw us out of here um, in Anna minutes. Wood would like to know, um, she says, my response to a student who says that reading is boring is you just haven't found the right book yet. What would you say to them? Well, look, reading is not boring. I mean, reading can be boring, but if you're reading a boring book, here's my advice. Thank you, by the way. Someone is waving Raven's Gate in the back there in, in response to my last question. Thank you. That's a few. Pretty here's the thing. If you're finding a book is boring, throw it away. There's no need to sort of sit there and go, oh, God, another page. Oh, no. If it's not a book you've been told to read by your teachers, and your teachers, by and large, do not choose boring books, so remember that. But if you're in the library and you start a book, it doesn't mean you have to finish it. Find the book you enjoy, and it won't be boring. So the answer to the, to the teacher's question is, 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 yeah, reading can be boring. I'll tell you a terrible truth. War and Peace, one of the greatest novels ever written. It's said to be the greatest novel on the planet. I think it's boring. I've never managed to read it. But that doesn't matter because I've read a thousand other books, you know? So to, to, that, to, the, to the teacher, I would say, tell your student not to worry that that book is boring, but not all books are boring. It's just simply that the student has to find the book that they enjoy, or if not, the student is boring. <laughs> okay? Well said. Uh, Miss Lamb from Connor Down School. Hello, Miss Lamb. Um, have you included... Uh, we've spoken about you being in a book, and you've mentioned people in Russia that you've met that you've turned mm -hmm. to characters. How about your family? Any of your family make an appearance? And do they know? My parents have been in my books lots and lots of times. In my earlier books, Gruesome Grange and some of the early books, I wrote a book about my grandmother. Now, my grandmother was a horrible woman. I mean, really, really horrible. I often, I've said this before, but I will say it again. In her in she was mean. She was really mean, she was snipey, she didn't like children, she was unhygienic, she stole the silver at lunch, the fort would disappear up her sleeve. She was not, and I often say that my grandmother in her entire life only did one kind and generous thing. She died. And, um, <laughs> now, I, look, I know it's a bad thing to say, I shouldn't say it, but let me say this to you. Don't respect people or love people just because they're old. Respect and love people for what they do in life. If they're good people, it doesn't matter if they're old or young. My grandmother was mean and horrible. She was a bully. She never looked after anybody else. She never made people laugh. So I put her in a book. So the answer to your question is, I've done, my parents appeared in books lots of times. My grandmother, I wrote a whole book about. It's still out there. It's called Granny. And I think it's one of my funnier books because I turned her into a joke. And, um, and, and yeah, and my, other, and other, my children have been in a couple of my books. They got very angry when they were young because in Stormbreaker, uh, the mine has got a piece of graffiti on it that says, Nick loves Cass. One of my sons is called Nick and the other is called Cass. They still haven't forgiven me for that, but because they didn't love each other that much at the time. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I put them in. I put all my family in. Brilliant. Um, Alanov, is that, or oh, Dylan? I've got one from Dylan here. Why did you choose the name Alex Ryder? Very good question, Dylan. I chose the name Alex because it was the name of the boy I met at lunch, the one I mentioned who did Taekwondo and spoke French. Yep. His name was Alex. A name is very important in a book. If his name was Maurice Postlethwaite, 
would you read the stories? <laughs> oh. As it happens, my best friend is called Maurice Postlethwaite. So there you are, you see, but just his name doesn't suggest a spy, does it? You have to choose a name that fits the character. Alex was a good, strong name. It ends in an X. It's only got two syllables, so it's not difficult to read. Uh, it's a nice modern name. Ryder, two reasons. Cowboys in the Wild West. They're riders, aren't they? Yeah. And knights in medieval England, when they slay the dragon, they're also riders. So it's a good, solid, action -y sort of name. Again, it's easy. It doesn't require, you know, you'd have to look at it carefully to sort of work out what it is. Alex Ryder. It's just a good name and it's stuck. OK, fab question. Um, what do you think of people writing fan fiction based on your work? That's from Alanoff. I'll talk to my lawyers is what I think. No, I don't <laughs> think that. No, of course I don't think that. If kids want to write fan fiction, that's great. I mean, you know, if my work inspires kids, young people, to write and to explore writing, mm -hmm. that's great. You know, write Alex Ryder books all you like. But I would say this to you. The greatest fun of writing is thinking up ideas, your own ideas, your own characters. You know, in all my writing, I've tried never to take anything from anybody else. Alex was inspired by James Bond. But the whole point of him is he's very different to James Bond. He's a completely different character. So I think, yeah, use my work to inspire you. I've heard of teachers who are using Alex Ryder in class to sort of, you know, inspire kids to write. And that's great. But the real fun comes when you leave that behind and say, he's, Alex is all right, but I can do better. Brilliant. Uh, we are getting so many questions. We've got about five minutes left to get through as many as we can. Uh, Chloe says, if Russian roulette was to be made into a film, oh, who would you cast as the characters in the book? That's a good question. Oh, my God. Well, there's only one character I think I could cast as, as Yasin Grigorovich, and that's God. Remind me his name. It's Michael... Give me a clue. Oh, God, he was, he's the greatest actor of all. You know, I can't really say it. Fassbender. Yeah, Fassbender yeah, yeah. as, as Yassin. That, would, that yeah. would be really cool, I think, because he's such a great actor. As to the other parts, I suppose Sharkovsky. Oh, who's evil enough to play Sharkovsky? Mm, Daniel Craig, actually. It'd be great to have James Bond playing yeah, the yeah, villain in an Alex guy, Ryder yeah. book. So that's a little bit of it. Um, you know, I'll tell you something. Sharkovsky, just talking about where characters came from, I was at a literary festival, and a man came out of a swimming pool, and he had all these hideous tattoos all over him, and he was Russian, and he looked exactly like Tchaikovsky, and he was surrounded by bodyguards. He was obviously a very, very dangerous man. That's a real character who I put into my book, just this man in a swimming pool. He was wearing these budgie smugglers as well, which was, oh, God, he was disgusting with his little pot belly. I thought, I, I'll probably get shot now for mentioning this, but he was, that was in Dubai in a book festival, and that's where Tchaikovsky, he plunged out of a surface. I said, that's a villain of my book. Amazing. Yeah. Um, William Robinson asks a very cool question. Um, people don't think about what you need to do to be a writer. It's not just sitting in a room writing a story or on your travels writing a story or researching by traveling. There's also, uh, that there are things that happen to you as a person, as a celebrity, as you get more and more well-known. And so this question is, do you enjoy being famous? I think I've got the best fame in the world, which is that people vaguely know my name and they vaguely know my work but by and large, they don't know my face. Even after today, I've been on television for one hour today with this very nice group here in this theatre here and with all the schools who are watching us have a thing. But the truth is that actually if J.K. Rowling walked into this room, I wonder how many people would recognise her because, you know, she's, she's not on telly the whole time like you are, Barney, where you get recognised probably all the time. So, and I don't want to be recognised. I don't want to be sort of, you know, standing on a street corner poking my nose or something and then have somebody photograph it and, oh, my God, it's all over Twitter, you know, famous writer poking his nose, or anything else. So I think I've got it exactly right, which is the name is quite well known, the books are known, but I'm not known, and that's how it should be. Fabulous. Um, I have to say sorry at this point because we've nearly run out of time. There's so many questions that have come in. This is our final question now. It's gone okay. so fast, hasn't it? Uh, it's a great question from Lizzie. She says, I'd like to start by saying thank you. Uh, I have dyslexia and would not read before. Thanks to your books, I'm a bookworm through and through. And now for my question. Since you finished both Alex Ryder and The Power of Five, I wondered if you were going to write any more yeah. children, young adult books. Well, Lizzie, first of all, thank you very much for your kind comment, which is really great. I love to hear about young people who've overcome the problems of dyslexia and difficulty of reading and have come to, to love books, which is what this is all about, as I say. And I can't stress enough how many wonderful writers there are out there. This is about me, my name there, but, you know, there are so many wonderful writers at their peak now. Discover them all. I, my next book is Moriarty. It's an adult novel, which is a sequel to It's a Sherlock Holmes story. Then after that, another adult writer, no, adult novel. And then after that, a trilogy of three books. The title, I think, is The Machine, 
But that's all I'm saying about it. I've got an idea, and it's beginning to bubble away in my head. And the second book is going to be called The Something in the Machine, and the third one will be called The Machine Breaks, or something like that. So it's a machine, machine, machine. And it's about an evil organization. It's set in the real world. It's set now. The main character is 15. He's a boy living in North London with his parents. That's enough. Excellent. Well, hopefully, the next Anthony Horowitz Live, we'll get to talk about that. But for now, Maybe. that's it for questions. Who'd like to hear Anthony read some of Russian Roulette? Just a tiny little Absolutely. bit to finish. It's all yours. I'm just going to read a very, very little bit, which is quite a nasty part of the book, which is where Yasin, who is now 14, has been captured by a hideous Russian called Sharkovich. And Sharkovich, who is this, um, this, this Russian, makes him play this absolutely terrible game. Sharkovich reached out and took the gun. He jerked open the cylinder and showed me that it was empty. Then the cylinder of a gun, I should say. Then he picked up the bullet, a little cylinder of gleaming silver, and held it between his fingers and thumb like a scientist giving a demonstration. I watched silently. I didn't know what was about to happen, but I could feel my heart pounding. He slid the bullet into one of the chambers and snapped the cylinder shut. Then he spun it several times so that the metal became a blur, and it was impossible for either of us to tell where the bullet had lodged. You say you will do anything for me, he said. So do this. The gun has six chambers. As you have seen, one of them now contains a live bullet. You do not know where the bullet is, nor do I. He placed the gun back on the desk right in front of me. Put the gun into your mouth and pull the trigger. I stared at him. I don't understand. It's simple enough, he said. Point the gun at the back of your mouth and shoot. But why? Because you said to me five seconds ago that you could do anything, you would do anything I wanted, and now I'm asking you to prove it. Go ahead, it is your decision, you must make it now. I don't have all day. Yeah. That's Russian roulette. Amazing. Thank you. We just got a message from a girl called Phoebe who says, please, one more question, just please, please, one more question. What is the question? I don't know. <laughs> we can't have it. We're actually out of time. But um, thank you so much for joining us for Anthony Horowitz Live. Uh, that was a unique experience for me too. Anthony, it's an absolute pleasure to always speak hey, to Barney, you. Hey, thank, thank you, you very much. Too. A round of applause for Anthony, everybody. That was amazing. And for Barney. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, hang on. Um, one more message came through. It's from Alex Ryder. He needs our help. Alex Ryder. Better go. Okay, well, see you later, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.